Okey-dokey. So, today we are um, we're going to start with Portugal, uh, kind of one of the uh, last Latin countries in Europe. And then we're going to kind of segue with that into Brazil, Uruguay, and Mexico as well to just kind of finish off the Americas. And then um, on a Thursday, we're going to do Germany and Austria. So pretty much the complete opposite of today. Uh, and then next week, we're going to go into other uh, European countries. Uh, so we're going to do Hungary, Slovenia, Croatia, maybe a bit of Greece as well. And, and that's going to be it for the actual regions. Then we're going to go to a little bit of service as well, because that's kind of one thing that I really want to touch on. Um, and obviously, um, sweet and fortified wines, that's going to be one session. So today, even with Portugal, we're not actually going to talk about ports. Just we're going to briefly mention it as it is important for the history. But um, yeah, we're going to do that as a separate session um, to get a bit more understanding of that. Okay, so let's get going. So Portugal, believe it or not, they started off pretty much the same as everybody else in Europe with the Phoenicians, the Greeks and the Romans. Um, that's when the winemaking started, but for some reason the, the Portuguese never really took to wine. So they were they're pretty much famous for drinking kind of a, a type of beer uh, for a very, very long time. The big break for them in terms of wine uh, came after the Spanish succession war. Uh, so when the last uh, Habsburg uh, monarch of, of Spain uh, died in 1699, I think, uh, he didn't have any any descendants. He didn't have any any children to take over. So there was a big war about uh, who's gonna who's gonna be the new ruler of of Spain. Um, obviously, that was part of Portugal at that time as well. I mean, the, the territory was ruled by the same <clears throat> by the same people, um, even though the Portuguese were kind of separate. Um, anyway, so as that war happened, the Portuguese were relatively small as they are still today so they needed help from elsewhere so they were they had uh, an agreement with the french um, that they will protect them that they will protect their sea so the french navy was supposed to kind of safeguard the portuguese uh, coastline <clears throat> and then the Eng the english as always they like to meddle with things uh, they they took their boats and they went down the coast down the the portuguese coast and they were moving around freely. So they went to the Portuguese and said, just so you know, we came through here with no problems. There was no French inside, so nobody's protecting you. Um, so obviously the Portuguese were like, what the fuck? And they started um, and they kind of disbanded the relationship with the French and instead partnered up with the English. Uh, and this was known as the Mechuen Treaty in 1703. Um, and this was kind of the, a very important thing in commercially for, uh, for Portugal. So Portugal didn't have a strong um, hand. It was the English that had the strong hand because obviously they showed them that they can attack them anytime they want. So the, Port the English got the better of, um, of the deal. And the deal was that um, on Portuguese imports, on, their, on the uh, import of their wine, there will be the same amount of tax as there is on the amount of tax they put on the French wines. So obviously France was uh, a big import uh, wine business for for the English but because they had this war because they had this friction between them those those um, deliveries kind of stopped and the English needed more wine from somewhere else so they, they said okay we're gonna get it from the Portuguese uh, the what the English gave in in return was obviously the protection of the seas um, and they gave them uh, the imports of textiles that the British were doing um, with no tax so the Portuguese weren't making any money off of uh, bringing in stuff. They were only making money off of taking it out, uh, which was the wine at that time. Um, now, this was a bit of a problem for Portugal, and this is kind of what set them back and why they haven't. I mean, you know, when you talk about 14th, 14th century, 15th century, Portuguese were one of the, the most important nations in the world. They were one of the biggest uh, colonizers. Um, but yeah, when this treaty happened, it kind of set them back and because they weren't making any money off of imports, uh, they couldn't really develop uh, industrially. They couldn't, they, they couldn't um, 
keep up with the other countries. <clears throat> um, nonetheless, that did do something good for us, and that was that they started developing wine a little bit more. Um, so in 1756, they established Duro, the, the wine region, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, um, as, the, as the third oldest protected wine region. So the first oldest was in 1716 was Chianti. 1736, I think, was uh, Tokai in Hungary. And then the third one was, was Duro. So um, quite a long history there. That being said, obviously, as we know, Portugal is famous for their port, fortified wines. Uh, so they weren't really famous for their still uh, wines. That only happened fairly recently, and they started producing super high quality only in the, in the, in the late uh, 1990s. Um, before then, I mean, they've always produced it. You've pretty much got about 50-50%, like in Duro Valley, there's 50-50 uh, production of port versus production of still red wines. Um, or still wines, I should say. Um, so they, they do make it, they, they've all them, always made it, they just didn't make a name for it for themselves. Again, the reason being the English, I mean, as you can see with the wine world in general, the English have a big say in everything. Um, it's, it's, it was very difficult to ever progress in the wine world if we didn't have the English at the market. They were famous for it. I mean, even today, England is arguably one of the most important markets in the world. Okay. Okay. Now enough with the history. Let's go to the actual regions. So first one we need to cover is Duro. Duro is the most important wine region. As I said, they they made their name with the uh, with the ports, uh, but they do make some very very good uh, still wines as well. Now the region itself lies around the Duro River, which is obviously this big one in the middle. Uh, you might remember it from when we talked about Spain but in Spain, it's called Duero. So the same river, two different names. And basically, if you look at on the east side here, uh, basically this is where Ribera del Duero is, which is one of the important Spanish regions as we talked about. And so that can give you an idea that vineyards around the area, around the river, tend to produce really, really high quality wines. Now, the region is divided into three parts and they're not just, uh, divided into size parts they're very very different in terms of how they how they they feel you have the baixa corgo which is kind of the below corgo region sima corgo above corgo so corgo is kind of a region here um, and then you have du duro superior now how are they different so baixa corgo is the hottest of all of them it is very very close to the city of porto so porto would be somewhere here um, so it's got a lot of those maritime um, uh, climate, uh, what you call influences already. So it's very, very hot. Um, Sima Corgo is the flattest of all of them. So this is where you actually get the highest production, uh, the highest volume. So I think it's, it's about 50% of all production of the Duro River, come, Duro Valley comes from here. And then these two have or around 25% each. So this is, the, this is where they make most of it. And this is in, in Pinao, uh, which is the village over here, the city over here. This is where most of the port uh, houses, more post uh, port wineries are, uh, or quintas as they're known, um, are based. Now the Dura Superior is arguably the most interesting one. If you've ever seen uh, photos of Dura, or actually let me show you here. So this is a photo of Dura very 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 steep vineyards so they have to use these terraced <coughs> vineyards to actually be able to cultivate them somehow absolutely beautiful area um, similar to the other two very very hot so this is a hot continental climate so you get very very hot summers very cold winters uh, but very dry at the same time as well um, and yeah these steep vineyards just allow for perfect maturation of the wine so when we talk about still wines when you talk about premium still wines from the Dura Valley most of them will come from the Dura Superior um, area. Absolutely gorgeous stuff. Um, one misconception about Duro is that they only produce red wine. Uh, and that again comes from thinking that port can only be red, which is not true. Uh, you do actually have quite a lot of white port as well, which is quite delicious. Um, I don't know if you've ever had it. Um, <clears throat> there's a, even a trend these days that they're trying to populate which I'm not sure about. And they're drinking white ports with tonic. Uh, 
yeah, judge for yourself. Some people like it. I'm not a big fan. Uh, but yeah, white party is basically a similar thing. It's a little bit of a sweeter style of, of, of wine, high, higher in alcohol and so on. Um, they do make rosé as well. In terms of grape varieties, so one of the main reasons why Portugal isn't a very important region in the wine world is because it's difficult to understand. And the reason why it's difficult to understand is because of all of these funky names that nobody can really pronounce, let alone uh, remember. Uh, but I've written down some that are relatively easy to, to remember and they're kind of the most important ones as well. So uh, maybe try to, try to remember these that they will help you out. Um, in terms of reds, the two main grape varieties that you will find are Turiga Nacional and Turiga Franca. Turiga Franca is more, most, um, most planted, but Turiga Nacional tends to be the most high quality. So you, I, I'd like to think to the, of them um, similar in Bordeaux, you have Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon. So it's kind of the same thing here, whereas Turiga Franca is the Merlot as in being more planted and Turiga Nacional being the Cabernet as in the, the, the more the high quality one, let's say. Um, they're not the same in style as to the others. That being said, we did mention Turiga Nacional already in these sessions and we talked about it in Bordeaux. And that's because uh, last year when they've changed the appellation rules for Bordeaux, Turiga Nacional is now allowed uh, to be grown there, which is interesting to say the least. I mean, like we said, the French and the Portuguese were not really friends after that mess up in the 17th century. Um, so especially for them to allow a Portuguese grape variety to be grown is very, very interesting. But with the climate change, that might be a really good solution for them. Um, so we'll see what happens from there. Uh, the other important varieties you need to know are Tinta Barocca, Tinta Cao, and Tinta Roriz. Tinta Roriz is actually um, Tempranillo, Tempranillo that you know in Spain. Tinta Roriz is just, it's, it's got a different name for it. Um, so that's another thing what makes Portugal a little bit different, difficult to understand is they have uh, a few of these varieties that we could recognize from somewhere else. Um, and they give them these local uh, names that again, make it a little bit difficult to, to connect the things. Okay. In terms of white wine, uh, we've got Cuveo, Mavazia Fina, Viozinho, and Donzellino Branco. Good luck. Uh, mostly they're used for, for port. There is definitely more uh, still red wine than there is uh, still white wine, but there, you, you can find some. Now, just to cover a little bit about port, uh, I don't want to talk about what it is and so on, but historically, what was important about port is that uh, it was a brand. Port was, it wasn't considered as a, um, as a vineyard kind of thing, uh, like it is in, in France and in, in Burgundy. Um, so how port got its name was basically on these importers. So mostly it was the English, the, the Dutch and the German uh, importers. They were, they were sailors that were bringing the wine from Portugal to England. So Obviously, when, when, when the wine was transported from France to England, that wasn't a problem for durability of the wine. The wine could survive because it was basically just going on, on the back of uh, wagons uh, pulled by the horses in a re relatively cool climate. But when they tried to bring in wine from Portugal to the, to, to the UK, that was a little bit more difficult because the wine had to go on the hot seas um, and travel all the way around. So it was a, a longer uh, distance, arguably. Um, and this is why port was important because it was fortified and that fortification, so the addition of, of spirit, protected the wine from cooking. So even in the hot seas, the wines uh, were able to survive. And on top of that, it was a little bit sweet, which was a, a good thing for the English. And then again, as we know, the English like their cheese and port and cheese are just a, a match made in heaven. Um, so this is what made them interesting. But like I said, the English were the 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 commercial guys, they were the marketers, they were the traders, they were the importers. So they were the ones that ended up putting their names on the, on the wineries. So some of the most important wineries in, in Portugal are owned by the English, are owned by the Dutch, they're owned by the Germans. Um, you might have heard of Taylors, you might have heard of Graham's, Dow's, 
all of these, they're all English, um, but they are Portuguese wineries, let's say. Um, so that's kind of an interesting thing. And this also kind of stopped. This was the, one of the main reasons, again, why Portuguese wines didn't really develop because all of these English rich guys owned most of the vineyards. They owned most of the, the land or they were able to offer more money um, <clears throat> for the grapes than anybody else. Um, so they had kind of a monopoly at that time. It was called actually the, the port, uh, um, port house monopoly, something like that. Um, so yeah, the smaller pro producers, smaller wineries couldn't really make it. There was only, I think, two Portuguese wineries that were ever properly imported into UK. The, the most famous one is the Casa de, Casa de Ferreira. Uh, I don't know if I pronounced it right, but yeah, beautiful stuff. Anyway, so just wanted to mention that as well. Um, once the EU started, um, that kind of disbanded this monopoly. Uh, and that's when, that's why the Portugal was so late to the party. And that's when they were able to finally kind of start developing their own wine chain in their own right from their own producer styles, rather than um, this big conglomerates that were, that, uh, were there before. Okay. Okay, second most important uh, region in, in Portugal uh, is Vinho Verde. So Vinho Verde is actually a region called Minho, uh, which you might be able to see down here, uh, which is kind of in the northern part of Portugal, next to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, there's a few similarities with Vinho Verde and, for example, Rias Baixas that we were talking about uh, when we talked about Spain in Galicia. Um, so kind of similar idea behind these they want to make their wines light they want to make their wines fresh um, again all to do because they're fishermen they all live next to the atlantic ocean so there's a lot of these fresh seafood um, animals that they like to eat um, so obviously they would make the wines to make with that um, vinho verde was actually a tiny part of the region but then they with time, as it became more and more popular, they expanded it to the whole of Minho region and it, and it became the massive region that we, we know today. Um, to give you a comparison, this would be kind of like a similar idea to <coughs> Chianti Classico and the Chianti region. So Minho Verde would be a, a smaller area within that. They don't actually have a Classico region because there's no real need for that. Um, what it means, so Vini Verde, you, you can see on the presentation as well, literal translation would mean green wine, but actually what it stands for is for young wine. And this is where a lot of the confusion comes from as well. Uh, most people think that Vini Verde again is only a white wine uh, and that it is green in color, which is not quite true. It does have a green hue, but that's just because it is a, um, the style of wine is, is, is to be drunk very, very young. Um, so. Vinho Verde means young wine. It means that it's basically bottled within six months from harvest latest uh, and it's drunk young as well. It's, it's, you don't see Vinho Verde with a bit of age on it. It just doesn't, it's not meant for that. It's not good like that either. Um, so like I said, you can find red and rosy Vinho Verde as well, <clears throat> but 86% of it is white. Uh, it's famous for being quite low in alcohol. So Vinho Verde can be between eight and a half to 11 and a half percent of alcohol. So very, very low in alcohol, um, quite fresh, high in acid. And it's got this little thing called, um, uh, it's, it's, it's got a bit of pétillance. It's got a little bit of sparkle to it. Now, originally how it started was, um, because they weren't very good at what they were doing, <coughs> in their bottles, um, malolactic fermentation started on its own. Obviously, it couldn't survive in that in that climate, but it did start. And that malolactic fermentation started producing a little bit of CO2, um, even a touch of that creaminess that that is consistent with it. But it didn't it, it didn't happen fully. Um, now, because this happened in the bottle, the CO2 obviously didn't have anywhere to escape escape to. Um, so that little spritz, that little uh, frizzante, kind of stayed in the bottle. Now, theoretically, this is a fault. This is not something you want to do. But people liked it. Everybody liked that little bit of spritz. Uh, so it became popular and it became kind of synonymous uh, with the Vinho Verde style. Now with time, they obviously they've learned uh, how to do it properly. They have 
I mean, Portugal in general has improved dramatically in their quality of, of winemaking. So they, they were able to stop that uh, malolactic -like fermentation from happening in the bottle, but they still wanted to give people that spritz. Um, so these days, most of the vinaigrettes will have a little bit of CO2 added to them. So it's an artificial CO2 uh, that they add to the wine to keep that spritz. You might find this spritz occur naturally in some wines as well, and it is not, um, it's not an actual CO2 spritz, it's an, it, but it's, it's a spritz that comes from high acidity and being a young wine, so a wine that hasn't mellowed down. So you might see some Rieslings from Germany that will have a little bit of spritz, or Grunewaldsteiners from Austria that will have a little bit of that spritz, and it's not related to CO2. A lot of people also think this is a, um, a fault that they will send the wine back. So I had a few conversations with, with customers and guests that brought me a bottle of vinegar right back and they said it's spritz, uh, it's, that it's off, that it's cooking. So it was, it's an awkward conversation to have, but it is intentional. It is supposed to be like that. Okay. Um, what else is special about Vinho Verde is that uh, it is a, a home winemaking thing. It is a very local thing. It's family. All of the wineries are, are kind of family owned. There's no big producers or anything like that. Um, these days we have about 19,000 different producers that make, um, make the wine. I think about 50 years ago there was 100,000 different producers that, that made it. So pretty much any every family that had a bit of a uh, bit of a vineyard or something, they were producing vineyard verde. So that was quite interesting uh, for them. Obviously, this is this is being reduced now. The smaller wineries are, are buying up their neighbors and stuff like that to kind of um, focus on winemaking professionally. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, they're, they're, they're not quite there yet. There's some, some that are making money off of vineyard verde, but most of it is still being drunk uh, at home or in for tourists. So Vino Verde is generally quite an interesting tourist destination as well. Um, in terms of grape varieties, again, quite a few that good luck uh, pronouncing them. Uh, but the two that you should know are Alvarino and Luero. So Alvarino is the same as the Spanish Alvarino. Uh, it is actually the Portuguese grape variety. Uh, so Alvarino should be the correct way to say it, but because the Spanish have done a better job in marketing. Um, it is more known as Albarino these days. Um, Luero, the other one, Lureiro, sorry, the other one. Uh, so these two are the two main grape varieties, the two main components that you can find in Vino Verde. But you've got others, you've got Arinto, Trajadura, Aveso, and Azala as well. Um, all of which kind of minor grape varieties and yeah, in general, you don't really know what you get. It's not gonna say on the bottle anywhere. <clears throat> you don't know what you're getting. Uh, but again, that's, that's the idea. Vino Verde is just a light, fresh, floral style of wine that you don't really uh, care what's inside of it. You just want it to be good and delicious and it goes great with your food. Um, as I mentioned, they do, they do make reds as well. You've got the Vinhao, Borasal, and Amaral, which are all three red grape varieties. Um, don't need to really remember this, but just so you know that there are red, um, red wines made in Vino Verde. Roses are made with in Cruzeiro, I think. Uh, great, again, not that important, but don't be surprised if you do see it or don't think that it's a mistake or something like that. Okay. All right, uh, one more important region is Dao. Dao is in the mountains, kind of uh, southeast of, of Duro. Um, it's interesting because it ranges in altitudes, as you can see on the picture in the back, although it's a bit of a grainy picture. Um, you've got a lot of these kind of very steep hills and then valleys in between. So you get vineyards that range from anywhere between 200 meters of, of altitude up, up to 1000 meters of altitude, which brings you a lot of diversity. That was a very interesting region in terms of, um, you don't really know what you're going to get. Um, it was also, kind of intentionally uh, planted. This used to all be covered by pine forests uh, and they kind of started to pu pull them out and plant the vineyards instead of it. So um, it was more of a, a forced uh, vineyard area, uh, but these days it's actually one of the best ones as well. In terms of grapes, uh, again, Turiga Nacional makes a big appearance here. Uh, Alfroquera is one as well and Aragones, which is Tinteroriz, which is Tempranillo. 
So to make things a little bit more complicated, again, they made um, the same grape variety that we know in Spain. They've named it another way here. Obviously, this all comes down to uh, <clears throat> to, to historically regions not being connected and not talking to each other. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is also that, again, the Portuguese, like I said, they weren't very organized. They weren't very well educated in winemaking or they, were, they didn't really care for it. So a lot of vineyards in, in Portugal, especially in Douro Valley and in Dao, um, used to have 10 different grape varieties in the same vineyard and they didn't even know what it was. So sometimes when you ask a, um, a winemaker in, <laughs> in Douro, what's, what's the blend? He won't really know the answer because he doesn't know what's in the vineyard. Um, they have kind of, again, started to improve on this. And when they are planting new vineyards, they always plant it with a single variety, just so they know what's in there. Um, but yeah. Uh, the other two grape varieties that you might find in terms of reds are Baga and Bastardo. And I will briefly cover Baga when we come to its uh, main, main uh, region. Bastardo is, yeah, it's just easy to remember, I guess. That's why I put it there. Um, they do make some beautiful whites as well, mainly with, uh, mainly with Incruzado, Marvesia Fina, and Verdejo. Uh, Verdejo is the same as the Spanish Verdejo. Marvesia Fina is the, is the Greek Malvasia that also made its way to Italy. Uh, we've talked about it before. Uh, and Encruzado is a, is a local grape. Okay, so just to give you an actual idea of how all of Portugal looks like. So uh, you've got the, the Duro all the way up here. So as you can see from pretty much the Spanish border coming uh, towards Porto. Then this is Minho uh, and like I said, this now pretty much all of it covers Vinho Verde. Uh, Dao is this one, so you can see a little bit more inland uh, and all kind of shielded from, from the, rest of, uh, the rest of the country with, with these mount mountains. Uh, and then a couple of others that I do want to mention. Um, so Bairada, this is one of my favorite Portuguese wine regions. Uh, it's kind of on the up and up uh, lately. It's fairly close to the ocean. So it's got a lot of those influences, but you don't see any vineyards right next to the ocean, uh, which prevents them from kind of cooking. Because uh, Portugal is relatively a hot region. Um, so it needs these climatic influences. It needs the ocean to kind of freshen it up, to cool it down. Um, but yeah, so uh, Barada is mainly famous for their, their red Baga uh, grape. So Baga, uh, is very, very interesting because it kind of, uh, I like to compare it to Nebbiolo because it is rich, it's deep, it's tannic, but it's got this elegance, it's got this Pinoir-esque um, elegance to it that I really, really enjoy. So if you ever see a Barada uh, on a list, definitely give them a try. Uh, ideally, if it's made with Baga, there are some other grape varieties that you can find there. Um, but if it's made with Baga, that is kind of, uh, a pretty impressive wine to go. Um, Alentejo uh, is down here. Alentejo is the latest um, protected region. Uh, it was only added in 98, I think. Um, but it is kind of making uh, waves in the wine industry. There's more and more of the wines coming from there. Um, mainly, again, with kind of local grape varieties. You've got Alicante Boucher, which is one of the historical uh, grape varieties. Very, very interesting, very complex styles. Aragones, which is again Tempranillo, as we talked about. And then for whites, you've got uh, Arinto and Encruzado that ki kind of <coughs> make up the most interesting wines. Um, I find a lot of quality coming from Alentejo. The reason for that is because it's a fairly cheap area uh, to buy vineyards in, so a lot of talented uh, young winemakers moved here um, and they started producing wine with their new know-how. Obviously, the, the, the longer we go in, um, the, the longer we, we kind of learn about wine, the, the more we know. So obviously the new gen generations tend to be better educated and tend to produce a little bit better quality of wine. So that's why Alentejo is definitely an important one. Um, and the last one I want to mention is this one over here. Colares. I did mention this when we were talking about Phylloxera, 
but uh, again, just to kind of cement that knowledge there. So Colares, very, very important region, uh, completely phylloxera-free, sandy soils, vines pretty much planted on the beach themselves. Um, so very, very important. You won't really find much wine from there because it's such a tiny region. Uh, but again, if you do, just know what you're having. You're having super concentrated, deep, very, very interesting styles of wine. Um, now, I didn't mention all of the other regions, but you can have a look. I mean, you can, you can find wine pretty much anywhere. Uh, in Portugal, most of it, again, is made for local consumption, uh, but the regions that I mentioned are the ones that are kind of getting a little bit more recognition and are being uh, imported a little bit more. Okay, so that's it for Portugal. Guys, any questions? Uh, is because there is Madeira as well. Is Madeira only for them that we were going to talk about port and sweet, or are they making some steel wine there as well? Um, mostly it's, it's fortified. We're just going to talk about the fortified for Madeira because it is, <clears throat> it is so hot there that they, they pretty much cannot do anything. Um, any still wines that are noteworthy, let's put it that way. But yeah, okay. we, we will cover Madeira when we talk about fortified and sweet. All right. Thank you. Cool. Anybody else guys? Okay. Okay. So. As a nice little segue from Portugal, uh, we're going to move to Brazil, which is obviously it's, uh, it's, it was its colony uh, back in the days. So as it was one of the first ones to be settled in the new world, um, obviously the wines were kind of the first things that they wanted to, to plant there as well. But because Brazil is super hot, it's super close to the equator, uh, they didn't really do that with any any particular success um, so they, they tried planting it they tried using uh, native grape varieties for wine production and nothing really really worked um, in 1840 the first uh, successful attempts happened and that was in the south um, so as you can see even today uh, the wine regions are concentrated down the south kind of as far as possible from the equator um, obviously you want that uh, that that coolness, uh, which you don't get in the tropical parts of most of, of most of Brazil. Uh, so they finally started planting wines there and they realized, okay, fine, we can finally get some freshness here. Um, and they started planting mostly American uh, vines. So there was a lot of Vitis Lambrusca there, um, not much Vitis vinifera that we know today. The first people that actually started doing it commercially were the big international uh, companies. One of the first ones was obviously Moet Chandon, um, who they're still famous today for making their Chandon sparkling wines um, in, in Brazil, as well as Argentina. So they basically saw Brazil was in, as you know, it's not a, it's not a very equally developed uh, country. Uh, you have some areas that are you know, probably better developed than Dubai, but then you have some areas that are, uh, you know, worse than worse than shitholes, uh, if we put it in, in mild words. Um, so it was, again, very, very cheap for people to come in and just invest, invest in the country. And yeah, Moen and Shannon was, was one of the first ones that kind of really took advantage of that and put their foothold in. Um, Vale dos Vinedos was the first protected wine region, and you can find it in, uh, I think it's in Serra Gaucha over here, which is kind of the most important region. Um, and they were, when they started doing Vitis onifera grapes, when they started doing international grape varieties, Merlot tended to uh, produce the best quality of wine. Um, but the further south they went, uh, the, the cooler it got. So they were able to start growing Chardonnay and Pinot Noir as well, which again, like I said, was mainly used for sparkling wine production. And today, most of Brazil, you will find uh, most Brazilian wine will be uh, sparkling wine. They do grow some other grapes. There's some Cabernet Sauvignon, Sauvignon Blanc. There's Cabernet Franc as well, um, which we used to have in the shop here uh, from Brazil. Um, but yeah, most mostly Brazil is important for sparkling wine. The one special thing about Brazil that everybody finds very interesting is the Valle de São Francisco. And as you can see, it is up here in the very, very north. 
<clears throat> what's so interesting about it is that it's only a thousand kilometers south of the equator, so very, very close to the equator. It is, so if you imagine, remember when we talked about the bands where you can grow uh, grapes, we're talking about 30 to, to 45 uh, degrees. Valle de San Francisco lies on nine degrees. So incredibly, incredibly impossible for them to grow grapes um, in all other logical things. But uh, the reason why they can do it is because it lies basically next to a river and that river provides all of the irrigation they need. Um, technically, they cannot produce good wines here. You, there aren't any quality wines from Valle de San Francisco, but there's a lot of uh, quantity and it's kind of cheap uh, bulk production wine that you get from here. Again, to get any kind of acidity, um, they acidify a lot, they, they add it in, um, they irrigate a lot. So yeah, it's not a high quality region, but it is the furthest, uh, the closest to the equator you will find uh, vineyards um, in any of the kind of big regions. Um, just a quick word on some of the producers that are kind of making their name. Chandon, obviously, uh, you know, th th there, is a, there is a really good sparkling cuvee that they make, which I won't remember what the name is. Um, but the others are Miolo, Salton, Villa Francioni, and Casa Valduga. They're, they're all kind of, they're all imported and they make some decent wines as well. Okay, <clears throat> so... One of the main regions is obviously here in Campania as well, which is bordering Uruguay. And Uruguay, unlike Brazil, has a lot, a lot better developed uh, winemaking industry. So they do make some sparkling wine, but they are more focused on the still wines that they make. Um, so the winemaking started with the immigrants again, uh, and these were mainly the Basque immigrants and the Italians. So basically the Basque immigrants, which are in the north of Spain, uh, they were familiar with this grape variety called Tanat, which was grown in the area, mostly kind of uh, on, the, on the lower lands of the Pyrenees on both ends. Uh, so they brought it over and then the Italians were, were good winemakers. Um, so they started cultivating it. So this kind of started to develop the land um, and, it, and it became um, the most planted grape variety in, in Uruguay. So Planet is still today uh, mostly uh, the most planted grape variety. I think it's around 40% of all of vineyards that is, is um, grown with that. Uh, the other grape that is uh, kind of famous in, in Uruguay is um, Albarino as well. They produce some really high quality Albarino. Um, you can find some other grapes. There's Chardonnay, there's Cabernet Sauvignon, there's Cabernet Franc, but in terms of high quality, in terms of good production, Tanat and Albarino are the two grapes that you want to look for when, you, when you're looking at Uruguayan wines. Um, Tanat has a bit of a good reputation. I get a lot of uh, old ladies uh, walking into the shop uh, asking for Tanat, and that's because the doctors uh, generally recommend Tanat um, to people with heart problems. Um, the reason for that is because Tanat has uh, one of the highest contents of polyphenols. So the, the anti, antioxidants that you can find in the, in the skins and the pips. Um, some other grapes would be Nebbiolo, for example. So basically what we're looking for is high tanning wines um, that are generally quite healthy. And these antioxidants, obviously, they, they keep the, the, the vine, the, the, not the wines, the veins uh, kind of young and fresh um, and they kind of dilute the blood a little bit to make it run faster and it keeps you keeps you younger for longer. So uh, if you want to stay young forever, uh, drink a lot of tannins. Okay. Okay. And lastly, Mexico. So we talked about Mexico when we talked about Spain because we, as we said, uh, they were, they were pretty important uh, wine producers in, uh, in the good old days. Um, so obviously Mexico does have one of the longest history uh, of American winemaking in general. And it started with the famous Hernán Cortés. So Hernán Cortés was this um, inquisitor that um, defeated the Aztecs and, and kind of took the territory of Mexico uh, for, for Spain. And they were, there, there's a legend that when they, they landed and when, when they won, they celebrated so hard that they drank all of their uh, reserves. So they drank everything they had on board um, and it wasn't little. Um, so as soon as they did that, he said, okay, 
uh, we're not gonna survive without wine. Um, so he ordered the planting of the grapes immediately. Um, so they started planting the first vines in 1521, which was the first recorded um, new world uh, winemaking at that time. So as we know, they, they got a lot of support from the Spanish for a long time. Uh, a lot of, uh, because of the missionaries, they were, they were developing the culture of wine drinking more and more. And at a certain point, Mexico was so important that um, the, the current USA wasn't buying wines from Spain anymore because it was cheaper to just get it from Mexico. <clears throat> and that's obviously pissed off the, the Spanish. So they banned uh, commercial production of wine in Mexico. Now this is where the Mexican Mexican wine kind of completely nosedived, uh, and they focused more on on uh, beer and tequila and mezcal, uh, which is still true today, as we know. But yeah, because they were banned to do this, they were only allowed to to grow grapes for the missionaries for 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 a church. Um, they didn't really develop in this in this way at all, um, and until 1821, this ban was was alive. So in 1821 was when the Mexican independence happened. So I think it was a 10 year war uh, with the Spanish, uh, which they finally won and, and gained their independence. Um, and that's when they kind of started going back into wine a little bit. Uh, not much though, because by this point, again, beer and, and tequila and mezcal were had such a strong uh, stronghold um, over everything that they just didn't um, really bother with it. Um, but there are still some really interesting wines coming from there and the quality has dramatically improved. There's more and more really high quality wines coming from Mexico. Um, unfortunately, not a lot of it um, imported, but hopefully that will change. Um, the reason why there's not a lot of it imported is because when they, when they finally were able to plant international grape varieties, the market opened for them. Um, not just for exporting, but also for importing. And then because the other countries' wines were being imported, there wasn't much interest for, for local for local wine. So it wasn't really, it was, it was a good and a bad thing that, that the, the markets opened for them. Anyway, in terms of regions, um, you can find uh, wine in uh, a lot of Mexico, actually, which is kind of odd considering how uh, hot we think it is. Uh, but these are all so in the central kind of Mexico, you will find high altitude <coughs> vineyards, but again, relatively low in quality. The best quality will come from up here, uh, which is Baja California. So <coughs> California is not the, the state of California that we know in America. California was actually, um, it's an interesting way of how actually it got its name. So the way California got its name was from a book. Uh, so there was this, it, it was like a, a novel, a romantic novel that was writing about an island that is somewhere east of Asia. Um, and it is uh, governed by the queen of Kalia. Um, and yeah, and, and that island was named California. So because when the Spanish uh, were kind of discovering America and they, they didn't find California from the east, they found California from the west. Right, so um, you know the English and the Irish, uh, when they when they were uh, emigrating to 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 what is today the United States, they went to the east side to Boston to New York, uh, and the French kind of down to New Orleans and so on. Um, but the, but the Spanish went the other way around, so they they kind of discovered this this uh, western part of the country, and they thought that it was an island because they, it wasn't that. Um, <clears throat> they weren't able to kind of go um, east of the Rockies and they thought that it was kind of ended. Maybe they thought it was the flat earth or something. Anyway, so because they thought it was the island and it made sense to them because everybody read that book, uh, they called it California. So California was actually uh, not just California state, but it was also covering uh, this, uh, this southern part here. So all of this are the Californias of, of America. Um, anyway, so Baja California, up here, they produce 90% of Mexican wine even today, uh, which is not much. They, it, it's still only about a million and a half cases of wine, uh, which is not much. Um, I think they're the fifth largest producer of, 
of wine in you know, six largest producers of wine in all of America. So behind USA, Argentina, Chile, uh, Brazil, Uruguay, and then Mexico. So very, very low. Um, and that's it. That's it from me for today, guys. So questions about any of the new world countries? Uh, question, as you say, we're finishing, I know it's not this one here, but question, uh, Canada, does it produce any wine? They do. Um, there is a, there's a couple of wine regions in Canada that you should know about. One is Okanagan Valley, which is in British Columbia in the western part of the country. So just north of, of Oregon, Washington. Uh, and the other area is around Ontario, where they, so in, in British Columbia, you will find quite a lot of different grape varieties. Funny fact is that even though it's so far north, it can sometimes be warmer and drier than California is um, in the summers particularly. So they are able to produce some really good Cabernet and Syrah, but their most famous wines will definitely be Pinot Noirs, uh, which are really, really spectacular. They don't get any love, unfortunately, but yeah, if you do find some Canadian Pinot from Okanagan Valley, give it a go. Um, the other region is Ontario in the eastern part. Um, they do make some Pinot Noir, they do make some kind of Chardonnay and white wines and Cabernet Francs and stuff like that, uh, but they are mostly famous for their ice wine. And I, I'm, again, I'm going to talk more about Canada when we come to ice wine and we come to sweet and fortified wines. But yes, they do make, they do make wine. Just very, very little. They make less than Mexico. Uh, thank you. Uh, just because of what you said, like we finish uh, America today. That was yeah. Here, man. Good point, actually. Anybody else, guys? Any questions? No? Okie dokie. So that's it for today. Uh, Thursday, uh, Austria and Germany. So brush up, brush up on your G German. Cool. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Does uh, what, just one thing. Does Mexico um, influence Panama by any chance in any production or anything or not? In what sense? I don't know. Is Panama product any produce any wine or? I don't know. Okay. They're quite close to each other. Yes. Um, not not important wine. Let's put it that way. You can find. I've actually heard of wine in Venezuela, in Colombia, in in Panama. In, in Guyana and everywhere, uh, uh, but nothing noteworthy. Like even even the one in Brazil uh, that I was mentioning, the, the one in the north, it's, it wouldn't be worth a mention, but it's just an interesting region that it's the, the wines are being grown so far north in the southern hemisphere. But yeah, we won't be, I mean, in terms of influences, it wasn't from Mexico. The influences were coming from the immigrants. They were coming from the, the owners, the Spanish, um, and the Portuguese and the French. Oh, thank you. No worries. Cool. Anyone else? Okay, okay. So, guys, thank you very much for today. And this will be uploaded again in, in four hours, I guess. Uh, and I will do the presentation now so you can you can download it right away. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see you on Thursday. See you on Thursday, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.